the Johnson Wax Program with Fibber McGee and Molly. The makers of Johnson's Wax for Home and Industry present Fibber McGee and Molly, written by Don Quinn, with music by the King's Men and Billy Mills Orchestra. Wax has certainly proved to be very helpful during these days when we have to take better care of our household things. Take your refrigerator, for example. A great many of you undoubtedly use Johnson's Wax, probably the cream wax, to protect the outside against fingerprints, smudges, and dirt. But I wonder how many of you have discovered that you can keep the wire shelves from rusting by giving them an occasional coat of Johnson's Wax. Let me read you part of an interesting letter that just arrived from a prominent businessman. Our electric refrigerator, like all others, he writes, is reaching the used stage. The wire shelves were rusting, and I suggested to my wife that she should clean them and give them a coat of Johnson's Wax. It really worked wonders and completely stopped the rusty condition of the shelves. Well, I'm very glad to pass this man's suggestion along. Johnson's Wax does protect metal surfaces against rust and corrosion. Try it on your refrigerator shelves the next time you're waxing your floors, furniture, and woodwork. If you could follow a mail carrier for one day and see the mixed emotions that he leaves in his wake, it would probably wear you out. So let's just follow the postman to one address, 79 Wistful Vista, the home of Fibber McGee and Molly. There's the dose, a letter for Jones, a postcard for McGee, a kiddly divey to post his due. Oh, ho, there's the dose, and a, uh uh-uh, number 79. And dozy do so the lambsy peanuts wouldn't do. Indeed, I would. Nobody asked me. <laughs> Good day, sir. Have I the extreme pleasure of speaking to Mr. Fibber McGee? You have, bud. At least I am. Are you the new mailman? Yes, I am, madam. And please let the post office department know if there's anything we could do for you. Oh, fine. We'd be glad to take a letter or postcard almost any place you say. <laughs> By the way, do you need any stamps today? No, Bob, I don't believe we do. I have you know. seen the new air mails? Very attractive and only six cents a piece. No, no, I don't think we Well, do. how about some threes? I don't think any real American can have too many three-cent stamps because... Now, I'll... look, bud, skip the salesmanship. You got any mail for me? Yes, sir, I have. One letter. There you are. Oh, thanks, bud. <clears throat> hey, what are you swaying back and forth like that for? You feel dizzy? Oh, no, I'm just training myself. Huh? Someday I hope to be a railway mail clerk and just travel around like everything. Well, good day. (laughs) (laughs) Ah, great personality. Yeah, reminds me of the Pony Express somehow. Around the neck, mostly. (laughs) Hey, this is the letter I've been waiting for. Who's the letter from? Woman in New York that analyzes character from your handwriting. Oh. I sent her a sample of mine several weeks ago. Oh, dear, what does she say? Oh, boy, oh, boy, oh, boy, this woman is uncanny. She's got my character down perfect. Listen to this. Your signature shows definite professional ability. Amazing. (laughs) Listen. It says, your writing shows a keen understanding of human nature, a deep sympathy for your fellow man. I... Hey, where are you going, Molly? I'm going to whistle for that mailman. He gave you the wrong mail. No. (laughs) Wait a minute. Now, listen to this. It says, it is to be hoped you are a physician. For you would have made an excellent one. Oh, dear. You are analytical. You You have a deep insight into human nature, and you have what is more important, the common touch. You get that, Molly? I got the common touch. (laughs) Why don't you study medicine, McGee? Or would you have to go back and finish high school first? (laughs) I always knew I should have been a doctor. Always wanted to be a doctor, in fact. If people could see your bedside manner when you're looking for your slippers on a cold morning, I don't think Ah, they'd see it. The common touch. 
Dr. McGee, physician and sturgeon. Now, listen. <laughs> now, look, McGee, don't start believing everything you read in your mail. To think of the years I've wasted, the lives I might have saved, the suffering I might have averted, oh. all because I never knew till now that I had it. The common touch. <laughs> You know, McGee, I always thought you had studied medicine at one time. Did you really, Molly? What made you think so? Because of my deep analytical? No. <laughs> because no doctor has ever prescribed for you yet that you didn't give him an argument. Oh, yeah. Well, that's because they all got what they know out of books. I got it right here, in the heart. If I was to ever... Oh, hello, Alice, dear. Hello, Mrs. McGee. Hello, Mr. McGee. Good day, child. Please sit down. What's troubling you this morning? Why, nothing is troubling. Come, come, child, relax. This, you can tell me, this nervous tension is something to be avoided. Well, how can she relax when you keep staring at the child, McGee? Are you sure you're getting enough rest, my child? Enough rest? Cheapers, I get four or five hours sleep every day of the world, my dear. That's enough for anybody. For a girl her age, McGee, she's... Hey, how old are you, Alice? Four going on five. Four going on five. Well, what's the... Oh, my birthday is February 29th, sleep year day. Oh, my <laughs> I have my fifth birthday this year. Ah, yeah. oh, a five-year-old child. <laughs> well, go ahead, doctor. Examine her. Maybe she's teasing. <laughs> please, ladies, please. Less levity. We can have any less. <laughs> now, child... I want you to stop worrying. Worrying? Cry, Minnie, I'm not After worried. After all, things like this may pass off in no time at all. The main thing is to... Things wa- like what, Mr. McGee? Gee, oh, I... stop scaring the girl, McGee. There's nothing the matter with her. <laughs> of course there isn't. Nothing <laughs> serious, anyway. Tell me, Alice, do you have a slight feeling of hunger before meals? Mm. <laughs> well? Yes, I do, but... Do you I... have a sort of a tired, sleepy feeling just before you go to bed? Yes, is that very serious? When you get out of the bright sunshine, when you go out of the bright sunshine into a movie theater, does everything go black for a brief time? Gee, come to think of it, it does. Mr. McGee, is there something... Well, now, Alice, what's the matter? You're getting pale. I... Well, I guess I don't feel very good all of a sudden. I think I'll go up and lie down. The best thing you can do, child... I'm afraid you've been burning the candle at both ends against the middle. <laughs> Here, have this filled. McGee, what are you doing? You have no business writing prescription. But this is just a blank piece of paper, Mrs. McGee. Yes, that's to put your gum into. <laughs> I don't want you swallowing it when you lie down. Now run along, child, and get plenty of rest. Drink a lot of milk, and don't worry. All right, but jeepers... I feel awful. Tom McGee. Jerry, what was the idea of all that? The common touch, my dear, the common touch. <laughs> Cheer up the sick ones and scare the junior out of the healthy ones. <laughs> it's all a matter of human understanding. The common touch. And I got it. Yeah, and you can have it. <laughs> <laughs> Billy Mills in the orchestra playing softly as in a morning sunrise. Thank you. 
human nature, <laughs> the humanitarian outlook. Take all the great physicians of the world. We all had it. <laughs> the common touch. Now, you take a great physician like Louis Pasteur. See, he discovered radium, didn't he? Oh, no. You're thinking of the wrong Louis. That was Louis B. Mayer. <laughs> Pasteur invented hydrophobia. Oh. <laughs> well, it wasn't very smart of him. The world would be better off if hydrophobia had never been invented. Well, that was his destiny, my child. When we got the common touch, like I got, we can understand that a human being is but a small cog in the vast machinery of the... Uh, of the, uh, of the, the... Saved by the bell. Yes. Come in. Ah, good day, Mrs. McGee. What a sight you are for sore eyes. <laughs> and McGee, dear fellow, what a sight you are. <laughs> nice of you to drop in, Mr. Wellington. Hello, Sigmund, my boy. I trust you will forgive me for my rudeness at the Rotary Luncheon this noon. I'm afraid I was not very tolerant. But that was before I knew I had the common touch. <laughs> what did you do that was so rude, McGee? Oh, nothing really at all, my dear. It was really nothing. He merely sneered at one of my humorous anecdotes. Oh. <laughs> the, one, the one about the little shepherd girl who disappeared, and they found her little sunbonnet weeks later out in the pasture. <laughs> well, tell her the payoff, Sigmund. I consider it very amusing. Thank you. The denouement of the anecdote, Mrs. McGee, is that the girl was victim of her own ignorance. Yeah. Her name was Ivy, and she didn't know that little Ams is Ivy. Yes? Oh, that, that's all. Oh. It went big at the luncheon, Molly. You made a fine speech, Wellington. Incidentally, you better watch your diet. I beg your pardon, old chap. What about his diet, McGee? For him, I'd recommend a high-protein diet. No roughage. Lots of whole wheat bread, no pork, lots of milk products, get lots of rest, and cut down on the smoking, Wellington. Better come back again and see me in about two weeks. And don't worry, we'll pull you through this all right. Mm, you'll have to. I won't go through it willingly. <laughs> oh, so sorry. I almost forgot what I came over for. Will you excuse me, Mrs. McGee? Why, certainly, Mr. Wellington. Thank you. I see my dear fellow. Hmm? Huh? Oh, Oh, sure, sure, sure. Glad to, Wellington. And don't apologize. Remember the sportsman's motto. It isn't how you played the game. It's did you win or lose. <laughs> what a charming person. Well, I must go home and give my great Dane his German lesson. You're teaching your dog German? Yes, in case we wish to travel and occupy Germany after the war. Yeah, but how do you expect a dog to speak German? But he already does. What? I started him off with Auf Wiedersehen. And already he can say Auf. <laughs> Good day. Thank you all for Well, what did he want, dearie? He wanted to borrow two bucks till Saturday. Well, if you didn't have it, at least you're getting it. What? The common touch. Eh? <laughs> Though I suppose the touch for one dollar would be even more common. What's the matter? I just wondered if Kramer's drugstore has got a stethoscope I could buy. What's a doctor without a stethoscope? Oh, now, just a minute, McGee. Huh? Don't go too far with this thing. What do you mean? Why, the first thing you know, you'll be caught practicing medicine without a license, and I'll be writing tear stained letters to the parole board. Oh, come, come, my dear Molly, come, come. Medicine is merely a hobby with me. Remember, I have the soul, the heart of a great physician. Really? Anyone I know? <laughs> <laughs> Hand me the phone, my dear. I shall call the apothecary shop. The what? You mean the apothecary shop? Yeah, the drugstore. Yeah. <laughs> Hello, operator. Give me Kramer's drugstore. Just below. Oh, is that you, Mert? Oh, dear. How's every little thing, Mert? Busy. What say, Mert? Your uncle. Oh, that's tough. Lost a pair of rubbers, eh? Doesn't he know where he lost them, McGee? Sure, they went in the army. Mert's uncle runs a Turkish bath. Oh. What they want? Okay, thanks. The drugstore doesn't answer. Maybe they ought to... Hello, kiddlies. Remember me, the man who sells the you-know that's so good for your stuff and things? <laughs> Hello, Mr. Wilcox. Hello, boy. Sit down and stop worrying about it. Worrying about what? The crease in your pants. It's all very well to be neat and clean, boy. But overemphasis on one's personal appearance indicates that one is socially unsure of oneself. 
You feel all right, pal? <laughs> he's all right, Mr. Wilcox. The great physician was lost in McGee, and he's trying to find it again. Health all right again, boy? What do you mean, again? Well, you did have the flu, you know, Mr. Wilcox, remember? Yes, and I remember a guy named Von Zell came in here and nearly ruined me. If you've got to analyze a character, pal, work on Von Zell. There is one. Oh. Fine lad, Von Zell. Splendid personality. And, hey, by the way, what do you mean I'm worried about the crease in my pants? That never worried me, and you know it. No, Mr. Wilcox is just naturally well-groomed, dearie. If that's a character deficiency, you could deteriorate a little yourself. <laughs> oh, come, come. I was merely pointing out that too much neatness and uh, coothness is uh, merely the result of the subconscious mind trying to overcome a natural tendency towards sloppiness. Is that clear? <laughs> Well, personally, I think it's a lot of mahula. Ooh. When people are neat and clean, it only means that they like to be neat and clean, that's all. Ah, but look, boy. Do you mean to sit there with your head between your ears and tell me that people all over the world use Johnson's wax because they feel socially unsure of themselves? Bird seed. They use Johnson's wax because they know how it'll save housework. It'll preserve and beautify their floors and woodwork and furniture. But subconsciously, boy. Subconsciously, they feel they're economizing, too. Because wax-protected things last longer and re require less frequent replacement. Yeah, but the common touch, Mr. The Wilcox. most beautiful common touch in the world is the touch of a Johnson waxed surface. Oh. The satisfying, smooth, satiny feel of a surface sealed against dust and dampness. Mm -hmm. And hey, if you want to play doctor, pal, don't try it on me. Hmm? I wouldn't let you examine the tongue on my coaster wagon. <laughs> Goodbye, now. <laughs> Hey, been holding out on me, eh? What do you mean? He never told me he had a coaster wagon. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, it's them little weaknesses of people that endears them to me. Oh, hey, I wonder how I'd look if I grew a goatee. Probably like a small buffalo, Bill. <laughs> <laughs> now, listen, you can just sit here in your mellow little mood and love the human race. I've got to order some groceries. Okay, Molly, dear. Ah, there goes a good kid. For her sake, I'm glad I never did study medicine. I'd have been constantly traveling all over the world, being consulted by famous people, with her sitting here alone, lonesome and neglected, watching out the window for her famous husband. I'm sorry, my dear, but my duty is to the world, I'd say. Did you know there was a petition to bury me in Westminster Abbey? No, no, not now. I mean, after I'm dead. <laughs> ah, I can hear them bells. The chimes of Westminster... Uh, <clears throat> oh. Come in. Good day, my child. Come in, come in, come in, little one. Do sit down. Well, I... Hmm? <laughs> I say sit down. I'm very happy to see you. Are you kidding, Mr. Hmm? No, my child. Why shouldn't I be glad to see you? Well, gee, you almost hardly never are, I betcha. Ah, but don't let my gruff exterior deceive you about my warm heart and great human understanding, sis. Well, I... Hmm? I... <laughs> well, generally speaking... My daddy says so, too. Says what? He says you're generally speaking. <laughs> yeah. Your old man. Ah, yes, your father. <laughs> Fine man, your father. Interesting example of a dual personality. If I can borrow a couple of pistols. <laughs> well, how do you feel today, sis? Not very good, I guess. You don't? Hmm? I says you don't? Don't what? You don't feel good. Say, how do you know? <laughs> <laughs> oh, just a gift for diagnosis. What's the matter? I got a little sliver in my finger, see? A what? A sliver. Hmm. It's too small for a splinter and too big for a sliver. Hmm. <laughs> well, that's nothing to worry about. I got one in my own finger. Come, sit on Dr. McGee's lap and I'll remove the sliver. Oh, <laughs> you're not a doctor, I bet you. Well, you mean if I never went through the ridiculous formality of getting a degree? No. But I got all the qualifications, sis. Human understanding, knowledge of people, and... And the common touch. Now, hold still. Okay. There. Now, that didn't hurt a bit, did it? <laughs> Gee, not a bit. I never even felt it. Well, that's because when you're a doctor at heart, you've got a sensitive touch. A dexterity in your hand. There's another reason, too, I bet you. What's that? You took the sliver out of your own finger. I, oh, my. Oh, my finger. Hey, Molly. Bring the eye back. Hold on. King's men sing Johnny One Note. Oh, Johnny could only sing one note, and the note he sang was this. Oh, 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 o
Justo and Justo were Lord in the place. Poor Johnny won those yellow quilly nilly until he was blue in the face. Poor holding one note was his age. Couldn't hear the brass. Couldn't hear the drum. He was in a class by himself, by gum. Oh, poor Johnny won those. In Aida, indeed, a great chance to be brave. He took his one note to howl like the north wind, a fourth wind that made critics rave. While Verdi turned round in his grave, couldn't hear the flute. Oh, they crumble. Everyone was mute. Johnny stood all alone. Cats and dogs stopped yapping, lions in the zoo were all jealous of Johnny's big trip. Thunder clap, stop clapping, traffic ceased in floor, and they tell us Niagara's the still. He stopped the train, whistle, halt, whistle, steam, whistle, pops, whistle, all whistles bowed to his heel. I'm brushing up on my medical studies. Hey, we got to get a new dictionary, Molly. This thing hasn't even got a simple medical term like pneumonia in it. Strange that our dictionary shouldn't have pneumonia. We leave it open half the time. Ooh. Well, it ain't in here. Look, it skips from New Market right down to Newsboy. Hmm. Well, uh... Have you looked at the peas? What good would that do? Pleurisy and pneumonia are two different kinds of things. Come in. Hello, folks. Remember me? I'm Beulah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Soup to cook. Well, how are you, Beulah? Come right in, yeah, Beulah. Yeah, thank you kindly, ma'am. Thank you. Are you getting along with the Toops, Beulah? Mr. Toops like your cooking? Oh, he do indeed, Miss McGee. Uh-huh. He do indeed. <laughs> <laughs> and so I just had breakfast this morning. He said, Beulah, he said, he was addressing me personally, you know. Uh-huh, yes. Yeah, so he <laughs> said, Beulah. He said, your biscuits are just like a feather. That's what he said. <laughs> like a feather, eh? Yes, and then he said, now can I have one that's more like a biscuit? <laughs> <laughs> uh, that old Mort, he's a, he's a cliff. He's got more wheezes than a hawk shop accordion. Hawk shop accordion. Put a man He's got the common touch, Beulah. Well, what can we do for you this evening, Beulah? Oh, nothing at all, Miss McGee, sir. Nothing at all. I, I just brought you a half a dozen cream puffs I just made fresh. Oh, thank you very much. Himself here just loves cream puffs, don't you, Diddy? Yeah, I'd like to fall in a well full of them and eat my way out. <laughs> Are you sure the Toopses can spare these, Beulah? We don't want to short them on ration points. Oh, no, sir. Mr. Toops, he ain't one for dessert, you know, and I, and I saved some for the kids. <laughs> Besides, I just want you to know Beulah's cooking, just in case. In case of what, Beulah? Oh, just in case, that's all. <laughs> you know when a gal bend over a hot stove all day long, she can't get frozen to a job like that. <laughs> Bye now. <laughs> Hey, McGee, you think she's hinting for a job with us? Mm. Yes, ma'am, I was. <laughs> there, she's a creature of impulses, as I read her character. Impulsive, warm-hearted, and loyal. Yes, sir, she's the kind of... Ah, uh, if I only had my medical degree. At $5 a call, I'd have made 30 bucks so far today. Come in. Oh, hello, Dr. Gamble. Hello, Molly. How are you today, my little hypothyroid? <laughs> Please, doctor, there's a lady present. I'd suggest we leave my thighs out of the conversation. <laughs> Don't mind me, boys. You know, it's been a long time since I was so delicate that I called a leg of mutton a limb of lamb. <laughs> you know, you look tired, doctor. I am tired, my dear. I've been sick for a week. 
But my confounded patients won't leave me alone long enough so I can go to bed and rest. I'm so run down, I got tread marks on my shirt. Hmm. Trouble with you, Doc, is that you bungle your cases. Huh? You rely too much on materia medica, not enough on human nature. The best way to practice medicine is not with pills. It's from here, from the heart. I see. And what would you prescribe for influenza, Dr. Gillespie? Long walks in the rain? <laughs> not at all, my dear sir, not at all. But I'd mix a little kindness and warm-hearted understanding in the treatment. Ah, uh, you know, when you say things like that, dearie, you get the moist, happy look of a horse that's just had a nice roll in a dirt road. <laughs> now, look, McGee, when I passed my medical examination... You did? So... Oh, that's great, Doc. But, hey, Molly, Doc passed his medical examination. I was wrong. He is practicing legally. Oh. Why? <laughs> Why are you insulting little gutter snipe? Are you trying to insinuate... Now, I... boys, please. Come, come, McGee. Don't lose the common touch. Oh, I'm sorry, Doctor. I forgot myself. Well, don't remember yourself on my account. <laughs> I was merely trying to point out, sir, that in the proper treatment of people, understanding is the prime factor. You've got to get behind the illness. Know what they're thinking. I know darn well what they're thinking. They're thinking, A, is this going to hurt? And B, is Doc Gamble going to let me off cheap? <laughs> the answer is yes and no. <laughs> The trouble with you, you lack the important essential for greatness in your profession. Yes? Yes. The common touch. Well, of all the impudent, unmitigated, double distilled arrogance, how you can have the infernal, shameless, insolent bumptiousness to stand there. Hey, no sympathy, no understanding. Stand there and tell me I don't understand my patience. Well, for three grains of monoacetic acid ester of salicylic acid, I'd kick your pudgy little carcass from here to Helsinki. <laughs> Oh, yeah, well, let me... Now, hush, right, McGee. Look, Doctor, it's all from the letter that he got. Yeah. Letter? What letter? This letter right here, Doc. It informs me in no uncertain terms that I got what you lack. Tolerance. Understanding. The common touch. Where did you ever get a letter like that? Off a Ouija board? No. <laughs> from a handwriting analyst, Doctor. She says McGee has the finest possible character to make a great physician. Yeah, they could tell that from my handwriting, Doc. Mm-hmm. Ain't it wonderful how accurate they can size a guy up from a mere signature? My gosh, Wait a minute, wait a minute. Huh? When you submitted that handwriting sample, didn't you ask me to mail the postcard for you? Yes, you did, McGee. I remember distinctly. Oh, so what? So what, Doc? <laughs> this is wonderful. What is that, Doctor? <laughs> huh? Why, his, <laughs> his handwriting was so illegible, I didn't have the heart to mail it. Huh? I filled another one out and signed his name to it myself. <laughs> <laughs> he, he, means, he means they analyzed Dr. Gamble's handwriting and not yours, McGee. <laughs> well, of all the dirty underhand... <laughs> Tolerance, my boy. <laughs> Understanding. Don't lose that common sense. Ball that dirty <laughs> low down the seatful <laughs> For those of you who have floors of asphalt tile, either in your home or place of business, you'll want to know that Johnson's Glow Coat is the preferred polish to use in protecting these floors. You apply glow coat to an asphalt tile floor in exactly the same way as to linoleum. There's no rubbing or buffing. You simply apply and let dry. Glow coat is self-polishing. It brings out the color of the tile, keeps it new looking. It's a cinch to keep clean. And it leaves a tough film that protects the surface of the tile against wear, makes it last longer. And, of course, for the care of all your linoleum surfaces, Johnson's self-polishing glow coat is the kind of product prescribed by linoleum manufacturers and good housekeeping authorities and proved in use on millions of floors. Ladies and gentlemen, we want to thank you for the wonderful way in which you answered our recent appeal to you to buy war bonds. We're sorry we can't give you the final results, as all the returns are not in. But we assure you, your response was magnificent. And today is the final day of the fourth war loan drive. So if you haven't bought as many extra bonds as you possibly can, now is the time to show your friends and relatives in uniform that the home front knows what to do in the zero hour. Good night. Good night, all. <laughs> The character of Wellington heard on this program was played. Program was played.